Pleasant Tides, Coastal Congregants. This is Five of Clubs, and today we're continuing our voyage through our Kingdom Death Monster campaign playthrough of the Scalding Seas. In the last episode, the Coastal Congregants embarked on their very first hunt, hoping to shift the Shrieking Eel from predator to prey. Well, as is often the case in Kingdom Death, This is not going to go the way you think. Indeed, we lost our first survivor to the sea. Wherefrom his body will be consumed and his beautiful face will carry on in the form of a majestic face fish. Okay, maybe that last part's not entirely true, but this lantern year was so bonkers it very well could have been. The eel took a life from us, yet also granted us the means of creating new life through Joseph the Eelborn, the first in the coastal congregation's second generation. Darien saw the haunted visage of a vessel in the distant sea storm, then nearly got blown up by a living jellyfish missile. And the hefty haul we took from our fallen prey helped us expand our arsenal for this hunt. Speaking of which, let's hop on over to the hunt board and get this eel hunt underway. Alright friends, it's time to begin yet another perilous, but perhaps adventurous hunt phase here. Uh, we have our four survivors over here. Darian is returning, uh, reprising her role as the leader of our hunt pack here, uh, trying her best to escape the haunting nightmares of the ghost ship. Which, uh, yeah, we hope that uh, that does not lead to unfortunate outcomes, but may in fact uh, continue on. Joshua is also returning. Uh, of course, I, we have a green character here, but this is not Jacob this time. This is the eel-born Joseph, who is sort of the spiritual descendant of Jacob. As Jacob left the settlement, uh, Joseph the eel-born arrived, so it seemed fitting to retain the green color. And not at all just because of the fact that the player board down here happens to be green. <laughs> and the uh, blue player, as well as Ashley, who will be returning. You'll notice that Sophia, while she did survive, and while she did perform admirably during this uh, past encounter with the eel, uh, she actually suffered a severe injury, which uh, reduced her permanent strength. And without proper weapons and armaments to spare, uh, I didn't feel like it would be a great idea to push her luck. She expended a lot of luck points. Um, theoretical luck points, uh, that is, in the last one. So I think that we're going to go ahead and try and send our A-team out. Okay, moving right along, as usual, we pick one person to be the designated event revealer, and we reveal the hunt event. Floating Eel Larva. That is a Shrieking Eel hunt event. The survivors spot a cluster of larva floating in the water. The event revealer must choose to harvest the larva or move on. Well, we are adventurous here, so of course we're going to harvest the larva. If you have a net in your gear grid, add two to the result. We roll a d10, it looks like. Okay. You know what? There's a d10 right here. And I like the number that's on that one. Let's see what we get. <gasps> I like that number even better. We're starting with the 10s. Mwah! Excellent. Here we go. Successful harvest. Gain monster level plus two basic resources. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, the fortune, the fortune uh, friends are smiling upon us already. We have a monster bone. We have a monster bone. And we have a uh, monster hide. Okay, so we have our three pieces of findings so far. We'll plop that right there. And actually, I that should have mentioned this, I equipped Darian with the face fish. Because there may be a point I might want to consume it to reduce her insanity to zero. Because I've learned that the only way to get rid of the visions of the ghost ship is to take brain traumas. So there's a particular brain trauma on the brain trauma table fittingly called memory loss and if you lose your memory you will also lose memory of the ghost ship that is currently plaguing Darian's mind so we may in fact be pursuing exactly that by reducing our insanity to zero and in its own weird way purposely trying our best to uh, get brain traumas to try and get that memory loss to occur okay all right well that was a lot of fun and by a lot of fun, I just mean that I liked getting free stuff from it. So, uh, of course, I'm positively disposed. Joshua will be our next revealer for the skeletal remains. Okay, so we had an eel larva, and now we have skeletal remains. Hey, you know what? This is actually fitting very well, right? Last episode, there was sort of this theme of, like, death and then life. Well, now with the monster, it's sort of inverted. There's, like, the life and now death. Uh, it's, it's almost like a yin-yang thing going on here. Wow. All right, the survivors come across a decaying skeleton of a shrieking eel. Maybe it was the land eel that we took down, huh? Could be. Nominate a survivor to investigate. They gain plus one courage and roll a d10. Otherwise, roll again on the hunt board. 
I mean the hunt event table for moving on the hunt board. So we have to decide if we want someone to investigate the skeel, the skeel, <laughs> the skeletal remains of this eel. Um, well, of course we are because uh, we're not, we're not, uh, we are not cowards here. We have to play boldly. I mean, look at this. We were just given three resources, which may in fact indicate our luck is about to turn for the worse. But we're going to be optimists here on this playthrough today. We are happy. We're going hunting. We're feeling like well equipped. We're feeling healthy. Let's go for it. Now, who's going to investigate it? Hmm. You know what? It seems to me that that Joseph the Eelborn should investigate the skeletal remains. Maybe there's sort of a psychic kinship he feels for the remains of uh, his eel father, or his, you know, spiritual eel father. All right, let's go ahead and roll. <laughs> yes, of course. What else would it be? We had our 10, then we got the eel born looking at skeletal remains. So naturally, of course, we have the opposite end of the spectrum and have a one. Oh boy. Uh, if you have a heavy weapon, you use it to snap off one of the ribs and gain a flexible rib cage shrieking eel monster resource. We don't have that. Otherwise, the bone snaps back without breaking. Suffer one event damage to the head. Oh, oh, oh no. Okay, Joseph. Uh, where are you? Wow. So he's going in there already with his head ready to take some severe injuries because he just couldn't contain himself looking at the skeletal remains and apparently trying to bust one of the weapons. I mean, uh, one of the resources out of it. Too bad he didn't have a heavy weapon, but then again, sometimes having heavy weapons can really... Uh, put you in some peril in this game so you know it's a six dozen of one half dozen of the other i suppose all right next space here we go oh and he should get a courage for that as well so let me go ahead and give him one courage at least you got a courage for your troubles there eelborn right moving on to space number three i think the eelborn after getting conked in the head he's uh he's really wanting to show his metal you know so he's like i got the next one guys don't worry dude you have a gash in your head. Are you sure? Yeah, dude, I got it. No problem. All right, so let's go ahead and roll these two dice for a random hunt event. That is a one and an eight. Thankfully, that's not the roll result that we just rolled, and the die is, uh, ah, it stopped. Okay, I was like, is it just gonna keep rocking back and forth? 18! It is a hunt event 18, so let's go ahead and go back. Keep looking. Oh, you're going too slow. Let me take the wheel. <laughs> It's too fast! How could you even tell what's on? I can tell. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you can go to the pages that way. I wasn't quite sure what pages uh, lined up for this particular book, but it looks like that worked. So we're at 12, 13, 18. Wailing smoke! Uh oh. <laughs> oh dear. A constant moan follows the survivors. As they enter an area shrouded in thick fog, the wailing re reaches a fevered pitch. Every non deaf survivor rolls a d10. Oh no. Oh dear. Is this the uh, is this the spectral vengeance of our our dearly departed screaming uh, eel? Uh, it could be. Every non-deaf survivor rolls a d10. If all survivors are deaf, they continue along heedless to the cacophony and the event. The lowest scoring survivor or survivors in case of ties become stragglers. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. We'll go ahead and roll a die here and here and here and here. There's a one. I see a one over here. Okay, the one is clearly the lowest result, and that is Darian. I'm kind of shocked. She must be shell-shocked by that uh, vision of the boat, after all. Okay, uh, let's see. And uh, if any survivor has noisy gear, the straggler and adds plus two to the result. We don't have that right now. If any survivor has noisy gear and the settlement has drums, they counter the whales with a tune from home. Do not roll on the table, and each survivor gains plus two insanity and plus two survival. Ooh, darn, it's too bad we didn't get drums. We got paint. Which is good for, you know, various things, but uh, having drums would have been great. Straggler rolls a d10. Oh boy. Okay. Here we go. That's a six. All right. Middle of the road. What is... Four to six. The fog grows soupy and begins to wail. You plug your, fing your ears with your fingers, but it's hopeless. Suffer monster level brain event damage. Well, that's okay. It's only going to be one, and we're going to want to try and reduce our insanity to zero anyway. It's too bad I didn't eat the brain fish earlier. Or maybe we could have uh, we could have uh, tried to get a brain trauma from that. I guess it wouldn't have given us a full brain trauma. It would have just um, given us a brain injury, but it would have been one step closer, wouldn't it? Okay. And that's all we have. Okay. All right. We made it through the wailing smoke. 
And now, last but not least, Ashley is going to reveal the third hunt event for the Shrieking Eel, which is <laughs> actually the Lonely Island again. <laughs> the survivors come across a solitary island. Nominate any number of survivors to investigate at least one. All nominated survivors gain plus one courage and roll a d10. So, I didn't actually, I forgot to ask for clarification whether you were supposed to nominate them and then all of them roll so they all get the courage. And then if someone just happens to roll a 1 or 2, the other guys get to keep their survival. Or if you dominate, then roll. And then if you haven't done the 1 to 2 result, then you continue on. I'm going to play as though if you get ambushed, it doesn't make sense the other people get courage. Because they didn't actually explore the Lonely Island. But I may have to ask the, what the intention is for that. Okay. All nominated survivors will gain a courage roll d10. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it uh, one at a time. Let's start with Ashley as well. Let's go ahead and give her some courage. There you go. And we roll a d10. Here we go. Oop, that is an 8. Oh, I wonder what the 8 is all about. You find a strange fruit growing from a curious vine. If you consume it, swap your insanity and survival values. Your survival cannot exceed the survival limit. Oh, wow. Oh, well, it turns out there's zero for both of them, and she shouldn't have that brain uh, injury there. Uh, so eating it uh, right now wouldn't have really helped us anyway, but if I had, I don't know, seven insanity, I could go to my max survival amount, which would uh, potentially help us out. Okay, it wasn't a bad thing. I suppose we could uh, continue on. Like, ooh, Darian. This might be a good idea for Darian. If she's able to swap her insanity and survival values, that might work out. Because we kind of want her to have uh, low insanity, don't we? That's a four. I don't think it'll trigger the same event. You find a partially buried stone chest. Inside, several vermin scatter from the partially digested, severed unmentionables of unknown victims. There is a box of unmentionables of unknown victims. Gain plus three insanity and one vermin resource. Okay, so it's like a box of bugs, I guess. Unfortunately, that gave us a bunch of insanity, though, which is the opposite way that we wanted to go. But we have the face fish to, uh, to back us up there. So we can always uh, reduce it later. And we get a vermin resource. So we'll shuffle that. I wonder if he meant aquatic vermin. Because, I don't know. Hmm... It's partially buried. Yeah, maybe several vermin scatter. Okay, yeah, so it must be like bugs, I guess. What do we got? This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. The face fish? What? Oh, that's an aquatic vermin. Somehow I think I might have shuffled the wrong deck. Let's do the vermin deck. The Cyclops fly vermin consumable. Archive this and roll a d10. One to three, the flies eye explodes, releasing acids that melt your insides. You die. Four to five, slight citrus flavor, no effect. Six plus, gain one permanent accuracy. Wow. Wow. So it turns out Darian is just racking up. Uh, she's got the face fish here. She has a cyclops fly. I mean, she's, uh, she's doing well. And let me go ahead and put that back on its deck. Not sure how it got over there. All right. Very good. Is there anyone else? And of course, she should get a courage for that. Is there anyone else here who we might want to swap the insanity and survival values? Like, if we had Joshua do it, he could get his uh, one over here to convert to a survival, potentially. Here we go. Or maybe a, a resource, right? Oh, it tumbled. I can't see it. What is it? A nine! Wow, okay. You find a strange fruit growing from a curious vine. If you consume it, swap your insane and survival values. Yes, so I think that's a great idea. We're going to go blop and blop, and we're going to hope that this is not a shrieking eel. Uh, and that is, uh, shrieking all the time, but I guess we'll see what happens. And I mean, it feels so bad to let the eelborn not participate. And I mean, that would bring him to second courage, which puts him one away from leveling up his courage stat and getting the bold bonus. Uh, but I really don't want to sw- I, says, I guess it says you may do it. Okay, let's do that. He's going to search as well, and we're going to hope it does not blow up in our face. <laughs> let's see. He was conked in the head. Seven! I think that'll let you eat the fruit. Yep. Apparently we all found fruit on this lonely island and we could eat it if we want. We really don't want to do that with Joseph because that'll take away his only survival point. And uh, that doesn't sound like a great time at all. Alright, moving right along. We are now uh, encountering the monster this time. And uh, yep, it's not ambushing us so we're not going to have to worry about the two turns in a row nonsense. 
and uh, he's not surprising us. So let's go over to the battle board here and uh, do a quick tactics talk before we dive in. Huddle up, everyone. Let's talk tactics. With the hunt concluded, it's time for us to draw our weapons and trade blows with our quarry once more. We're much more prepared for this year's showdown against the eel compared to last time, bearing a few new benefits that should pay dividends in our battle performance. For one thing, all of our survivors gained some permanent stat increases since the last bout. As a result of our first birth, our society opted to pursue the survival of the fittest approach to cultivating our congregants, granting all current and newborn survivors plus one permanent strength and plus one permanent evasion. The strength bonus will help make our wound rolls easier to hit, allowing our axes, spears, and bone darts to successfully wound the toughness 8 monster on a roll of 4+. The plus one evasion bonus will make us harder for the monster to hit as well, plaguing it with an extra 10% chance to whiff its swings. Joshua and Darian will have one more evasion as well, since they met the red slash blue affinity connection bonus outlined on the rawhide vest cards. Speaking of Joshua, he was able to score plus one permanent luck resultant from his mourning of his fallen coiled brother Jacob. This means Joshua will be critting on wound roll results of 9 or lantern 10, so he'll have a 20% chance to crit. And we outfitted him with a luck charm, which grants him another plus one luck on top of his innate luck bonus, causing him to crit on eights as well. 30% crit chance per wound roll is a recipe for success if ever I saw one. Joshua also bears an eel eye patch, allowing him the second blue connection in his gear grid for the luck charm, but also allowing him the option to spend an action to peek at the hit location deck. This can help us keep tabs on the responses in the hit location deck, and may help us optimize our placement and turn order. Both Joshua and Darian adorned their heads with rawhide headbands, allowing them one point of protection at the head location, but also granting them the ability to spend an action to view and rearrange the top two cards of the AI deck. This will simultaneously allow us to know what's coming next and position ourselves to optimize the intended target for the AI card. Ideally, this will help us orient attacks toward Joshua and Darian, who are 1. partially armored, 2. have higher evasion than Joseph and Ashley do, and 3. have survival points to dodge if needed. Previously, survival points could only be spent to dodge and encourage. Now, thanks to our new paint innovation, our survivors now have access to the dash survival action. This dash action allows the survivor to immediately resolve a movement activation, meaning they can move a number of spaces up to their base movement value. Additionally, since this is a survival action, there are special mid-turn periods where dashing's potential can be harnessed to glorious efficacy, but we'll see those when we get there. So, I originally had a placement strategy in mind that I was going to share for this battle here, but my initial approach was completely upended by the pull of our random terrain card for the battle. We ended up getting the Dead Monster Terrain card. As you can see here, the Dead Monster Terrain is a game-changing terrain card indeed, allowing the survivors to be placed anywhere on the showdown board, and granting survivors the first turn. The last eel got the jump on us, and now it seems we're getting the jump on this one. No, we won't get two turns in a row, but we do essentially skip the starting monster turn, and we get to start out wherever we want. As such, I think I'll plop Darian right into the blind spot with the intention of attacking first, and I'll place Joshua four spaces back from it with intentions of attacking thereafter. Why not place them both in the blind spot? Well, as you recall from the previous fight, this monster has a few hit location responses that target all swimming targets within three spaces. If Darian triggers one of these cards, I don't want any of our other survivors getting stunned and losing the advantage of our ambush here. After Darian attacks, I plan to move her out of that range before Joshua sneaks in for his blind spot attack. Hopefully we can get a few wounds on this monster while it's chowing down on that delectable decaying corpse there. Joseph and Ashley can take to the shoals first, preventing them from being swimming targets and, at least in the case of Joseph, gaining the benefits of an accuracy buff to his ranged weapon. Indeed, Joseph may not have any armor, but he has our team's first ranged implement, the Bone Darts. These will allow him to attack the monster from up to 6 spaces away, though it only lets him roll 1 die for its speed. This little attack could come in handy for some pesky hit location cards, like the first strike cards that cause it to slither 2 spaces forward. Potentially, Joseph's bone dart range can still target the monster even if it slips forward, allowing him to still attempt the wound unlike his standard melee companions. 
Additionally, this will be our first foray into the randomized weather and tides cards. The prologue fight didn't have any, and the last battle was preset to calm seas and calm skies, which didn't change things up too much. This time around, we'll be shuffling the weather and tides decks and drawing one card from each to represent the weather and tide conditions for this battle. The weather forecast indicates a strong sea breeze, resulting in heavy winds. To my surprise, this weather condition primarily appears to assist us, inflicting a minus one accuracy penalty on the monster. Before we get carried away with our celebrations over this mercy, our voices will have trouble carrying through the winds to one another, preventing us from performing the encouraged survival action to stand our buddies up unless we're adjacent to them. Overall though, I find this an agreeable exchange. For the Oceans and Tides card, we actually get a special terrain type, the Great Blue Hole. This is an unobstructing terrain tile that represents a hole in the bottom of the sea beneath us. Additionally, if we're feeling brave enough, it appears that our survivors can dive down into that hole in hopes of finding submerged goodies. Perhaps we'll go diving down there during our playthrough today. Lastly, now that the hunt phase is over, I think it's about time to discuss our spectral ship issue. As you know, Darian headed out on this hunt with the intention of distracting herself from the psychic stain of the ghost ship that she spotted in the sea storm. Well, in a mechanical perspective, she picked up the ghost ship ability that will trigger a second ship sighting the next lantern year, closer than it was before as though drawn by her fear, tormenting Darian's psyche even further. That is, unless Darian can find a way to suffer the memory loss brain trauma, in which case she'll forget all about the ghost ship. As luck would have it, the ghost ship ability has a subtext which allows you to add or subtract one from your brain trauma rolls, which increases our chances of getting that memory loss trauma from 10 to 30%. Darian is our matriarch, and she's proven mentally resilient before, so it seems thematic to me that she would try to wrestle, perhaps even mangle her own mind under control. In pursuit of that, Darian will consume the face fish ASAP reducing her insanity to zero and rendering her vulnerable to brain damage and traumas. With enough slams against the brain trauma table, the hope is for her to carve through her sanity and excise that haunting memory. Will she be successful, or will she succumb to the strains of purposely induced trauma? Let's find out together. And break! And let's dive on into it. Okay, we have our friends set up here on the board as per the uh, new setup because of the dead monster and all of its uh, delicious splendor there. Indeed. And uh, we get the first turn. I think we're going to start with Darian. Uh, she has been uh, out of the uh, fighting the Shrieking Eels and she's feeling the absence of that. So I think she's going to go first. And the first thing she's going to do is consume this face fish, which uh, as a reminder, if you are insane, set your insanity to zero and gain an understanding for consuming. Nom, 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 nom. Yum. Delicious. <laughs> understanding there. And we'll set this to zero in the hopes that we might be able to give ourselves some severe, uh, severe um, not severe injuries, in the hopes that we might be able to give ourselves some brain traumas, as it were, uh, backwards as that may seem, uh, on the surface. Okay, well, she is ready to attack, so let's roll two dice with her bone axe hitting on a five plus here. That's an eight and a two, so the eight will hit. We have the Alacritus Anal Fin with a wound response. Each survivor in the blind spot is sprayed with a violent release and rolls a d10 on a three plus. They suffer damage to a random hit location and suffer knockback five. Oh man, here I thought we got the jump on the Shrieking Eel. And it turns out the Shrieking Eel uh, was perhaps unintentionally ready for us there. Because uh, actually she is in the blind spot. So if she wounds, she would get uh, hit by that. But let's see if that is the case. Will she make it? That is a 9. A 9 plus 3 here is 12 plus 1 permanent strength for the fact that we are uh, survival of the fittest set now so yes indeed that is 13 which certainly surpasses the 8 value triggering the wound response and a wound there we go all right she's got a roll and see if she's going to get sprayed with that violent release we have what is that a one okay so actually she dodged the uh violent release there so excellent work darian and let's go ahead and use our move activation let's just move her a little bit one two three four right above the great blue hole here which i know is 
uh, not finalized art here. I know that looks like the Lion Knight, and that's because it is. Uh, but it's going to be this size, and if you hover over it, it says Great Blue Hole. So the idea was to, uh, to replicate it in that regard. Okay, moving along, it's time for Joshua to go. Let's go one, two, three. And Joshua, likewise, will attack this creature. Oh, uh, ignore that third die. It's only going to be the first two. So we have a four, a four, and a six. Ah, too bad. That third die would have been a hit, but uh, Joshua actually missed. He missed all three of those attempts. Too bad. Right, and I guess we have Ashley next, and she gets one free movement because she's starting her turn from a shoal tile. If she moves one, then she could go one, two, three, four, and she could poke at the behind of the Shrieking Eel here with her Reach to Flex Spear. There we go. All right, so that's going to be two dice here, hitting on a six plus and a three strength here. So we have four and seven, so that is one hit. Here we go. Alacritus Operculum, Reflex, full move the monster away from all survivors, cancel all hits now out of range. Well, she's only hitting it once, so if it runs away after that, so be it. But uh, that will not impact us in any negative way. Let's go ahead and roll. That is five. Five plus three is eight, plus the one strength up here is going to bring it to nine, which is going to result in a successful wound. Bam. There we go. And the reflex, it's going to slither away from us here. So, one, two, three, four, five. It stopped uh, filling its gullet and has decided to move on. Now, Joseph over here, uh, he didn't have a whole lot he could do because now the creature is outside of that range six for his bone darts. So, hmm. I guess he'll do the one free movement because it's free, so why not? I really want someone to go after the dead monster here, but I don't think it's going to be Joseph. So I think he's going to use the Shoal Tiles action to rest, which, though he doesn't have exhaustion tokens to remove, he does gain plus one evasion till the start of his next activation. All right, that's all four of us. So now it's time for the monster to go. Hyperactivity will give it plus one movement token as usual. And a shriek! Here we go with this already. Target all non-deaf survivors. The Shrieking Eel lets a powerful, high-pitched screech intimidate all targets. Each target rolls a d10 on a 4+. plus. They suffer monster-level brain damage if they're insane. Other things happen. All right, Miss Darian, you are first. Let's go ahead and see. That is a 4, so she is going to take one brain damage, which is actually good. Because remember, again, we want to trigger those brain traumas. Because we want her to potentially forget about that ghost ship, if possible. Joshua... Here we go. Let's uh, see a one to three, my friend. That's a five, so we'll hit that there. Bam. All right, we have Joseph the Eelborn rolling here, and he got a six. So we'll put that right there. And Ashley as well, rounding out the end there. Oh, it almost tipped to that three, but as you can see, it uh, stopped on the seven. So everybody got screeched at. And uh, anyone who is still insane would have gained bleeding tokens and targets brought from 3 plus insanity to less than 3 would have gained extra brain damage. None of those things will apply here. And despite the fact that the heavy winds uh, stop us from being able to occur encourage each other from a distance, apparently the shriek carries across those heavy winds without any sort of trouble. Alright, good to know. Okay, moving on to the next round. Hmm. I say... Let's have Ashley go one, two, three, four, and maybe we'll have Ashley take a look at what's inside the Great Blue Hole. Who knows? It could be great. I mean, it is called the Great Blue Hole, so, and just as a reminder, what you are able to do from there is uh, resolve the spelunking story event, which sounds like maybe you're going in after a pursuit of treasure. I'm not sure. Okay, next up, I think we'll have, let's have Darian hang tight. Let's actually have Joshua go. One, two, three, four. And so he has moved right here. Let me just make sure. Yes. Okay, so he has moved right here into the blind spot of the eel yet again. And perhaps if he can wound it, we can get rid of that uh, plus one movement token. Okay. Two D10s here, Joshua. Three and two. Okay. Uh, neither of those are going to hit. Wow. All right. Fair enough, Joshua. Okay. Uh, moving along, let's go ahead and move Darian down. One, two, three, four. And for her action, since she cannot reach the eel anyway... Let's go ahead and activate the Rawhide Headband here, which will let us reveal the top two AI cards, place them back on the deck in any order. So we can kind of see what we're in for on the next turn. Oh, Intimidating Display. Hmm. If we could get Darian up in range for that, to be the closest survivor in range, 
then we could actually have her potentially take brain damage here. Maybe we'll try and shoot for that. Let's see if it's possible here. Right now, uh, Joshua is the closest survivor in range, but Joshua could spend a survival point to, to dash away. And if he does that, one, two, three, four. If Joshua moves, one, two, three, four. Okay, they'll be equidistant, and then we'll get to pick. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Okay, so I know this seems kind of crazy, but actually I, I think hopefully it'll pay off for us. So we'll go one, two, three, four. He is dashing out of the way, and that puts him at range one, two, three, four, five. And Darian is at range one, two, three, four, five. So that's how that works out. Very good. So we'll have the stunning bite go second. But uh, hopefully we'll wound it before such a time as that happens. So I guess we'll have to see. Right, and then I suppose we still have Joseph and Ashley left to go. I think Ashley will go ahead and do the spelunking event. She's going to spend her move in action... Actually, no, I guess, I think she moved on to here, so she wouldn't be able to do that just yet. Correct! We're going to have to wait till the next turn for her to do that. Okay. And then Joseph, uh, hmm. Not a whole lot for him to do, so I think he's just going to kick back in his beach hammock there. And he is going to rest, allowing him to uh, get that plus one evasion till the start of his next act. So, very good. All right, I think that's everybody. So now it's time for the eel to go. Second movement token because of hyperactivity. And we know that it wants to intimidate the closest survivor in range. Right now, Joshua is the monster controller. So he's just going to decide that uh, he wants the monster targeting Darian. All right. So Darian will have to roll a d10 and on a 4+. plus. She is going to get uh, one brain damage, gets knocked down. That's a 7. And again, we want this in its own weird way. She'll be scarred for life if we're lucky. We want this to happen. So uh, let's make sure we get her knocked down. There we go. Get her an exhaustion token if she's still knocked down by the end of the round. And last but not least, we have to roll on the brain trauma table. Okay, so just to review here, we are aiming to get that three results, memory loss. And that will, it says lose two le levels of weapon proficiency, but the good news is she doesn't have weapon proficiency to lose. So this is actually an ideal time for us to be able to get that memory loss to trigger. But remember, of course, we also have a plus one and minus one modifier. So if we roll a two or a four, then that also counts toward the memory loss here. Okay. Alrighty. Here we go. Roll, 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 roll. A ten. Good. Good. No, Bob. That's bad. What? Oh, what? I don't want a ten. Frenzy. Gain one D5 insanity, one speed token, and one strength token. Ignore slow on melee weapons. Well, I guess we could do plus one. Or a minus one if we want, but I don't know that we really want to do that. You're knocked down and gain 1d10 insanity? Nope. Gain a d5 insanity, plus one speed token, plus one strength token, ignore slow on weapons, you may not spend survival, you may not use fighting arts. Ugh. Maniacal laughter at 11. You, gain, uh, you are knocked down, gain minus one speed token, ooh, the priority target token, and 1d5 insanity. Yeah, that's not good. <sighs> I guess... I guess we'll go with the Frenzy because we, we're going to get some insanity almost no matter what we do, which is going to set us back toward actually getting those brain traumas, but uh, it looks like that's the way it's going to be. So let's go ahead and roll this here. And of course, we're going to get five insanity somehow. Ugh. Ah, darn. Hmm. Okay, because that's 1d5 insanity and we're going to get plus one strength. Here we go. And plus one speed. Here we go. And then we won't be able to use those fighting arts and uh, so on and so forth. Hmm. Okay, at least she's going to be a bit better of an attacker, though. So that's kind of nice. She's knocked down on her face right now. But aside from that, uh, she's doing great. Okay, back to our friends again. Let's start with Ashley looking in the great blue hole for the spelunking event. And that is one of the story events here. I'm not sure which one. Let's see. They're in... Uh, alphabetical order though so i should up oh, there's spelunking there we go underwater caves are ripe for exploration with a brief glance back at the fight in progress you dive down toward the massive blue chasm deep under the sea determine the active depth terrain and dive in okay we are fighting in deep water and we know that because our terrain here uh for the depth card is set to deep water for this fight okay and we dive in by rolling a d10 okay here we go what are we gonna find in here that's a five. Okay, it's about a middle of the roads. Shouldn't be too bad. 
Four to six. The walls of the chasm funnel the currents to breakneck speeds. You are pulled deep into the hole and are and are smashed on a small cavernous outlet. <laughs> Suffer three damage to a random hit location. Investigating the outlet, you find a small pile of dead people. Gain three basic random or random basic resources and one exhaustion token. Uh-oh. Well, it turns out poor Ashley is uh, getting smashed against some sort of an outlet. Uh, and she's getting smashed in the body, which is the largest uh, part of her figure, so that kind of makes sense. Okay, three damage. We got our light and heavy boxes filled, so that's going to knock Ashley down. And additionally, we have one more, so we have to roll on the severe body chart for poor Ashley. So let's go ahead and give this a roll. Oh, it was almost a 10, but it ended up being a 6. What is that? disemboweled your movement is reduced to one until the showdown ends gain a bleed token skip the next hunt if you suffer disemboweled during a showdown at least one other survivor must live at the end of the showdown to carry you back to the settlement otherwise at the end of the showdown you are lost and dead oh no <laughs> okay all right support so ashley uh, is getting minus one movement tokens to reduce her to one movement I, uh, ooh, okay, eating the tensling bracelet's not going to fix that entirely, but it might be something we can do. Uh, oh, wow. Okay, one movement. But interestingly, you'll notice that even though that person's been disemboweled, it doesn't say that's like a permanent injury. It says until the showdown ends. So we just skip the next hunt, and somehow during that time, uh, our time off, we are re-emboweled. Uh, though I'm not sure that's entirely a word. <laughs> okay. Re-emboweled. Yes. Uh, such are the things that happen in Kingdom Death Monster. All right. Oh, and she's uh, going to get an exhaustion token at the end of this round as well. Okay. Moving along, I suppose Joshua can go right on up and fight this monster one more time. He seems uh, keen to do so. He's been missing so far, but maybe now is the turn of the tide uh, for Joshua here. We have six and seven. There we go. That's two hits from the front. All right. We have the Alacritus underbelly with a wound response. The monster shrieks in anger. Attacker gains priority target token. Or the Alacritus eyes with a wound response wherein the <laughs> where the shrieking eel focuses on the attacker. They gain the priority target token. Okay. So no matter what, it looks like priority target uh, is going to be... Uh, the benefit of or rather the detriment of, of hitting this and if you remember as well That's quite fitting for Joshua because in the previous episodes uh, He seemed to get that blue priority target crown in both of them So it's almost as though he's just he likes to be the center of attention here. All right. What do we got here? Uh, six, okay six plus three here is nine plus one is ten. So that certainly will wound bam bam bam, let's get rid of one of those and, of course, uh, he gets his priority target crown, but he wouldn't have it any other way. Okay. And the Alacritus eyes, which uh, the only downfall to those is you'll get uh, to be the priority target, but he's already that. And he rolls a crit, the mad lad. Way to go, Joshua. And remember, he's using the bone axe, meaning that that crit actually deals two wounds. There we go. And instead of getting the priority target, which he already has, critical wound. The wound severely damages the monster's eye and it gains another minus one accuracy token. Well, this is going to be one inaccurate eel, my friends. Bam! There we go. He got him with that uh, savage axe and savaged the eye of the shrieking eel. Very good job, Joshua. And at the end of the... Oh, it's uh, already checked for some reason. At the end of this battle, now that he is done uh, a wound with the axe, he's going to be able to fill in the first box on his weapon proficiency. So that is super good. Okay, and you know what? Ashley will do likewise because she is a spear person and she did manage to poke uh, this beast at the start of the game. So very cool. All right, so we have five wounds now. So we're already halfway to our goal, but uh, the the game is uh, going to continue on because there's more to do. And sometimes in Kingdom of Death, things can spiral downhill very quickly. Okay, Joseph's over here. He's just hanging out. And uh, maybe we'll... Uh, we could have him dive into the water. Splash. And then he has his four movement. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Let's actually put him right there. Yep. And let's go ahead and just have him chuck some bone darts at him. Just, just because. He has bone darts. They hit on a seven plus. That is a nine. So that is going to hit. 
And we have the Alacritus Hide with a failure response. Okay, let's not fail. He gets to add three here, plus one is four. Five plus three is eight. Here we go. Plus one is nine, which actually wounds the Alacritus Hide. Very good. Bam! And that gets rid of this other token yet again. Ladies and gentlemen, we are... Um, we're savaging this poor eel. Uh, the heavy wind is over there. It got smacked in the eyes with a crit. Uh, this is just this is just wild. Okay, and our other friends are all laying down in the water. So that's going to be the end of their turn. It's the start of the eel's turn. It's going to gain one of those movement tokens back. Oh, and we have a mood card. Uh-oh. When this comes into play, the monster, it's called streamlining. And this basically works like this trait does. It comes, it's an ongoing thing that does various different bits. When it comes into play, the monster gains plus monster level movement tokens, okay? If this brings the total plus one movement tokens to at least twice the monster level, which it does, draw another AI card. Uh-oh. At the end of the monster's turn, if it has less plus one movement tokens than quadruple monster level, so if it has less than four, gain a plus one movement token, then full move the monster forward. What? Discard this card when the monster has no plus one movement tokens. Oh, no. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh boy that's not good oh and we have a shocking burst which has a pick target step all survivors swimming in range four so currently one two three four so currently joshua is actually the only person who is an eligible target for that um hmm so interestingly it has a uh, two speed it does four plus which is really Six plus, which against Joshua with his one permanent evasion from Survival of the Fittest and from the one evasion from his Rawhide set is an eight plus. This monster rolls two dice looking to hit us on eight plus. That's pretty good odds. I was going to have Joshua spend some Survival to maybe dash out of range because uh, you see this little arrow here? That means that we are able to engage like Survival actions midway through the pick target step and the attack all targets. So if I were to, like, dash right there, after it picked the target, it's already picked Joshua, so it won't use its uh, no target effect, even though Joshua won't be in range, he could back up four spaces, and then this monster basically would just resolve the attack and no one would be affected by it, which would be great. But in the weird circumstances that we find ourselves in, he's rolling two dice and he hits on an 8+. plus. I like those odds. I don't know that I want to spend a survival to dash, Given that Joshua, oh, and actually the monster controller right now is Joseph, uh, and given that Joshua has survival, he could dodge if he needs to. Um, what are the odds, you know? Those are good, good odds. I think we'll, we will. We'll have him take it because, for one thing, it'll make him no longer the priority target because the monster has targeted him successfully for an attack. It's going to roll two dice here. Okay. Three and six. See? Nothing to worry about. Joshua is completely unbothered. I think he's just treading water, maybe folding his arms with uh, very serious eyes. I think the pain of having lost his coiled brother Jacob is still fresh in his mind, and he is taking out surrogate vengeance on this new eel instead. Okay, so that shocking burst isn't going to do anything for this monster. Very good. And then at the end of the monster's turn, if it has less plus one movement tokens than quadruple, it's uh, monster level, so more than four. Or uh, if it has less than four, sorry. Gain plus one movement token to move the monster forward. So if it moved right now, it would actually run over Joshua. So given that we have one of those uh, little uh, icons right there, we are able to have Joshua dash. So I think that's what we'll do. We're going to go ahead and spend one survival. And Joshua is going to move one, two, three, four. So now he's out of the, the way from this eel. Because this eel is just going to go barreling straight forward uh, seven spaces it looks like. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. And Joshua would have been uh, collided into if he were uh, hanging out there. But in this case, we got him out of the way, so there was no trouble. Okay. And it is the end of the next monster turn. So our friends Ashley and Darian both stand up. And it's the beginning of yet another round. Hmm. Indeed it is. Uh, hmm. Let's actually have Darian go. One, two, three, four. She's uh, ready to enact some vengeance because, remember, she has plus one speed and plus one strength. And, of course, she does have that now. So she's going to get to roll three dice here instead of the printed two on the bone axe. Okay. Uh, oh, as we say, two ones. Okay, we have one, seven, and three. So we have one hit. Okay, so we needed all three of those dice, it looked like. Uh, if the Shrieking Eel has more plus one tokens than its monster level, it deftly dodges the attack. Cancel this hit and move the monster two spaces forward. 
And Kansalani hits now out of range. So it's going to squeak on up, so she's not going to be able to resolve that attack. Ah, too bad. But this is kind of why I actually had her go first instead of Joshua, because now Joshua can move four spaces and still be within Shrieking Eel range. So that was the idea there. Um, and Ashley actually is right there. Though she's limping and whimpering, so I think she's going to move her one sad space because her movement is reduced to one. And let's go ahead and just in case, let's go ahead and eat this tenseling bracelet. Yum, yum, yum. Delicioso. There we go. Healed up our spot and we suffer the frenzy or we enact the frenzy trauma, which is going to give us some insanity, which is D5 insanity. So that's seven rounds up to eight divided by two is four. There we go. So we got four insanity there. And uh, we also get, oh, the plus one speed, plus one strength. Here we go. And we can't use fighting arts or spend survival, though she doesn't have any survival anyway. Um, so I, I think that's probably okay. Keeps her just a little bit safer, just in case. Okay. Moving along, Joshua. Here we go, Joshua. We're going to go one, two, three, four. Oh, and you know what about Ashley? I forgot to give her the three. The, she took that battering on her body, but I actually didn't give her the three random basic resources yet. So let's go ahead and do that. Monster Organ, Monster Bone, and Monster Hide. So we now have everything that we need if we want to innovate uh, next Lantern Year, and maybe we will. Okay. Now Joshua has moved up here, and uh, he's going to attack from the blind spot, as is his prerogative. Though actually, he seemed to have a better job attacking it head-on uh, before, didn't he? Seven and a Lantern Ten, but this is a perfect hit instead of a crit. So just a little early, Joshua. Okay. Oh no, it's the trap! Oh boy. Capacitor, discharge, trap, reshuffle the hit location. All survivors are doomed. So that means that none of us can spend uh, survival to run away from this attack. And uh, full move the monster toward the attacker. Remove all plus one movement tokens from the monster and extend the shock zone into the dark balloon zone by one ring for each movement token discarded. So in a good way, it has now reset its movement token count, meaning that uh, it now is at zero. So streamlining is just going to go right there in the trash. Because, or not the trash, but it goes in the discard pile because you discard this card when the monster has no plus one movement tokens, which uh, is currently the case. All right, but then so doing, we have to extend this thing by two rings, meaning that basically it's going to target anyone within three ring spaces from itself. So that's going to be uh, everyone here, it turns out. So uh, Joseph is uh, playing it smart, keeping his distance, but uh, unfortunately, our friends here, good thing that she consumed that tensing bracelet because she might need it. All right, and it's going to perform a basic action attack against each survivor in the shock zone and targets wearing metal suffer additional monster level damage to each hit location. Okay, so we'll start with Ashley. That's gonna be two dice, but the good news is the minus two accuracy is going to help pay out. So there we go, that two is gonna miss and the six uh, needs to hit on a five plus and even with her plus one evasion, it would be six plus, but it just barely made it. So that's one hit coming to Ashley. Okay. Uh, what do we got? We have the arms location, according to the system log. The arms. Boop. There we go. Okay. Very good. Next, we're going to, uh, let's see, Joshua. We're going to do 2d10 against Joshua, who has two evasions. So uh, this is really, oh, pfft. Please. I think missed Joshua by a mile. Two and three would have been uh, misses even without Joshua's plus one evasion from survival of the fittest and the rawhide vest. So uh, no biggie. And Darian as well. Last but not least, let's see if she gets hit by anything. Oh, that's a that's a ten. So yes, that's going to be a hit. The four. Uh, she has the same evasion as Joshua, so uh, she would dodge the four, but or the four would miss rather. And uh, we have one hit coming our way to Miss Darian. What do we got? The body. Oh, can't you target the brain? We really want you to target the brain. Okay, the good news for the body, though, is the fact that we are wearing some body armor, meaning that that damage will go to the uh, body armor location first, rather than uh, inflicting injuries on our friends. So, you know, there is that at the very least. Okay, all right. Well, now we've triggered the trap. It's time to reshuffle this deck. And we saw the trap kind of early there. That was in the first seven hit location cards. Very, uh, very uncommon. All right. And Joseph is last to go, and I think Joseph's going to go one, two, three, four, and he's going to get right up here next to the dead monster with the intention of trying to harvest it on the next turn. Very good. 
Okay, everyone's gone. It's now the monster's turn. Plus one movement token there. And we flip this deck and shuffle it. So that mood we got rid of might come right back. Who knows? Okay, no, it's not. It's going to be the Shocking Burst, which targets all survivors swimming in range 4. So almost exactly the same range as that trap. It's going to be able to hit everyone here. Although, uh, on Joshua and Darian at the very least, it's hitting on an 8+. Plus, and uh, for Ashley, it's hitting on a 6+, plus, I believe. Uh, let's see. 4, 5, 6, oh, 7+, plus, because she has 1 innate evasion. So, I mean... Uh, Darian has one survival, but she's frenzied right now. One of the key rules about frenzy is that you cannot, uh, spend survival. So even if she wanted to dash, she couldn't. Josh was out of survival, so we're just gonna have to take this raw, it looks like. And Ashley is the, uh, monster controller right now, but it's attacking multiple targets. Right. Uh, I suppose, let's just go ahead and, uh, do it again. Ashley, here we go. Two dice, hitting on a seven plus. Those are pretty good odds. Two and one. Perfect. Missed. I think this poor eel, we, th that conk to its eye, I think, really just really just messed it up. The heavy winds are just not favoring its uh, ability to move on the sea and attack as normal. So, uh, it, But, you know, sometimes uh, the game is uh, nice and sometimes the game is mean. All right, Darian here, uh, two dice. We have a two and a seven, but it needed an eight plus because Darian does have one uh, innate evasion and one here on top of the two here so that are those are both misses despite how high of a roll that is and joshua as well two dice here hitting on eight plus that's uh an eight so there actually is one hit coming to joshua here and where is it going to hit let's find out together that's the body which uh, is going to deal two damage if i saw right two damage with an after damage effect so we've uh, done that and thankfully joshua also had his body covered very good and uh, it looks like we have to roll a d10 and subtract the number of exhaustion tokens from the result. He doesn't have any, so he's not going to minus any from the uh, result here. Let's find out. That's a 9. Wow. 7 through 9, Invigorating Shock. Gain a plus 1 strength token. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, man. So Joshua just became even more of a beast. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yes, even when the monster hits Joshua, it helps Joshua, it turns out. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, and that's the end of the monster's turn, so now it's our turns to go. First and foremost, uh, you know, if we want, Ashley could strike out with her spear. She is at, uh, she is enraged, right, or, uh, frenzied right now. Sh you know what? Sure, why not? Three dice, and from where she's at, she's hitting on a six plus with that reach two. Nine, seven, and three. So that's two hit locations here. First strike with the Alacritus Caudal Fin. If the Shrieking Eel has more plus one movement tokens than monster level, it swiftly avoids the attack. Well, it only has one because it just set itself back doing that uh, capacitor discharge. So that's the very good news here. With a failure response, the monster gains a movement token full move through the attacker. Ugh, that wouldn't be good. All right, but she does have the plus one strength from being frenzied right now. Three, uh, four, five, six, seven for the innate strength, but the plus one brings it to eight. So if she were not frenzied, it would have been a failure, but she is frenzied, so that barely brings it up to the uh, mark of a wound. Bam, bam, bam. And we still have one other hit as well, which has a reflex to move the monster away from all survivors, canceling all hits out of range. Not great, but I guess, you know... You can't always win. Oh, and then she rolled a one there. Okay. All right. So no wound this time, but it's going to run away from all survivors. Here we go. And it's going to get to move five spaces. One, two, three, four, five. Why are you running? Why are you running? There it is. And honestly, if I was it, I would also think of fleeing. And I think probably I would head toward that edge of the board and just keep swimming. But uh, our friends are probably not going to mercifully let it go this way. In fact, I think, uh, speaking of our friends, I think Joshua, uh, likewise, is going to, uh, going to attack this creature. And you know what? Before I end my turn, let's go ahead and actually do the one movement. So before I end the turn with Ashley, we'll let her move back one more space just to keep her out of range. Joshua, one, two, three, four, right into that lovely blind spot that Ashley has just uh, so generously created for us. And Joshua, uh, maybe this invigorating shock 
will uh, be what we need to pummel this monster into oblivion. That's a one, but uh, we have the inverse with a 10 there, so that's going to be one successful hit. Ah, the Sax Terminal, first strike. Roll a d10 for each swimming survivor within three spaces of the monster, and, you know, do that as a reflex. Okay, hopefully, uh, if we're lucky, maybe Joshua will crit uh, this monster. I guess we'll see. Oh, it's so close. I saw the 10 there, or the 8 actually would have crit as well. So we have 4, plus 3, strength 5, 6, 7, 1 and 8 strength here, and then plus 1 strength for the Invigorating Shock. That brings us to 9. That is going to be a successful wound. Bam, bam. And this monster is going to resolve the reflex where we have to roll a d10 on a 5 plus. We suffer monster level damage to two random hit locations. Let's see. Oh, that is going to do it. So we uh, suffer one damage to two random hit locations. The arms and the head. The head is armored, so we're good on that. And the arms uh, have their first light injury, so that's not so bad. Way to go, Joshua. Okay, uh, Darian is here. I think Darian will get a little closer. One, two... Maybe right there. Actually, you know what? No. Before she moves, let's take a look at the AI uh, that's coming up here. We have Rawhide Headband letting us look at the top two. I think there's only... Uh, there's two left here. So basically, we get to choose what we see next. All right. Between these two, we have Streamlining, which uh, which wouldn't be amazing. That would actually be... Hmm. Uh, yeah, but the Shocking Burst is just so great, right? Considering how inaccurate this beast is, the Shocking Burst is fantastic. Let's just have the Shocking Burst go, because currently, right now, Josh is the only eligible target for it anyway, and uh, his uh, the, dog, the monster would have to roll an 8+, plus. so feeling pretty good on that. Thank you for looking at that, Darian. Appreciate it. And Joseph is going to move on to the monster here and try to harvest some helpful resources. Perhaps the monster didn't finish its meal yet. That's a 9. Let's see what that gives us. Okay, scavenge rule is 7 to 10. Gain a random resource from a monster resource deck of your choice. Then archive this terrain. Wow. Okay, so we're going to get one of these here. We have braided sinew. Very good. And we'll pop that copy right there. All right, we'll give that to our friend the eelborn. And we'll delete that uh, monster terrain because uh, you archive the terrain after that. Okay, that's everybody. So it's the monster's turn. Hyperactivity gives it plus one movement token. Very good. Shocking burst. Yep, all survivors swimming in range four. Yep, we do have one right there. So two dice hitting on eight plus. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, one and eight. So we do have one hit coming our way. And where is it going? To the waist, which we also have armor at. One and two. And it's time for us to roll a d10. And depending on what we roll, we might get invigorated even further. Let's find out. <laughs> no, no, that no, is a no. seven. <laughs> <laughs> Invigorating shock. Gain plus one strength token. Oh my gosh. Berserker build Joshua. It, whatever this monster throws at him, the Joshua just does not care. Nope. Doesn't care one bit. <laughs> that's amazing. Great job, Joshua. Very good. Okay, and that's the end of the monster's turn, so I think it's time for us to go. Uh, let's have Joshua go. Why not? He's in the blind spot. He's going to roll two dice here, and he is feeling, uh, oh, there's a 10 there. That's good. And what do we got here? Six. Okay, six and 10. That's two hits. All right, first strike on the Alacritus Pectoral Fins. If it has more plus one movement tokens to monster level, you know the drill. It runs away, but it only has one, so that will not happen. All right, with a failure response, Joshua, please do not fail us, my friend. What do we got? Ah, <laughs> uh, naturally, a natural 10, which again, with the bone axe means two wounds, one and two. And the critical, if the monster has any plus one movement tokens, flip one of them to a minus one movement side. So interestingly, I don't know. I guess that resolves, well, when the monster suffers a wound. I'm not sure which of these is supposed to resolve first. It would be really great if this one is. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to... I think it, when it suffers a wound... I'm not sure. But what I'll, I'll play it as fair as I can. So I'm just going to put it over there and remove it instead of flipping it, as awesome as that would be. <laughs> but uh, yes, indeed. Way to go, Joshua. Very good job. And we have the Alacritus Spine, plus two toughness to win this location. Well, thankfully uh, for us, Joshua has been prepared for this. He has been given two invigorating shocks. 
to overcome the plus two toughness of this hit location. And now I think certainly uh, he's going to be set for this. Let's go ahead and roll. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. He rolled back to a four. Oh, no. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is what we have. And look at this. The toughness is eight plus two is going to be ten, which means that it is a successful wound. Bam. Great success. Bam. Way to go, Joshua. You uh, you really did it, buddy. You uh, you pulled through for us. That, that's much is for sure. And the Beast Slayer fighting art, if we had enough survival, look at this. If you land a killing blow on the monster, which we did, you may get a plus one per permanent bonus to an attribute of your choice by spending survival equal to four plus the current attribute value. And so unfortunately right now, we don't have any survival and we don't even have enough to really capitalize on that. But if that were the case, uh, Joshua would have just uh, leveled up one of his stats as well for having slain this beast and brutalizing it as, as he did. Oh my goodness, Joshua, way to go. All right. Well, everyone, that means everyone's going to get some hunt XP. We get one there. And for those of us who dealt wounds with our weapon proficiency weapons, we're going to get uh, those as well. So we have one there. Joseph's getting his first hunt XP. Very good job. Bam, bam. There we go. And we have one hunt XP coming to Darien, meaning she gets her age bonus now. So let's go ahead and get to the milestone events age. Yes, indeed. So she gets to pick a weapon proficiency path. Um, what to pick for her? Uh, sword proficient. There we go. She'll be proficient with the sword. Yes, indeed. Okay, and she gets to roll 2d10 on the age chart to potentially get some sort of a bonus here. So let's find out what she gets. 3 and 1 is 4. That's pretty low. 3 through 6 gained plus 1 permanent strength. Okay. Very good. So she now has 2 permanent strength, as you see when I delete these tokens. She now is going to be able to add 2 to whatever the weapon bonus is. So with a sword, uh, potentially that'll help wound, and it won't make it... Uh, feel so bad when I give this axe to somebody else, perhaps. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. Well, this is great. And, of course, we also get uh, our resources, which we've already got a pretty broad uh, showing for that. We have three here from the hunt. We have three over here for Ashley battering uh, her back against a rock. And uh, now we get to add four more basics and four shrieking eel resources. Oh, we got the one uh, from here from the monster corpse that was being uh, chewed on as well. We have a monster hide, a monster organ, a monster bone, and a monster hide. Righto. And for the eel resources, we have electro receptors, okay, which counts as both organ and scrap. Interesting. Okay. We have the eel eye. Okay, we have another eel eye. Perfect. Okay. We have the slick hide, which counts as hide uh, result as a resource as well, and another slick hide. So there we go. Lots of hides here. We might be able to finish up some rawhide armors and... Uh, do some other various things in the settlement phase and let's go ahead and dive into that overview right now bearing a massive haul the hunters return in splendor and glory to the settlement the new gear crafted from the wake of the last hunt paid off indeed and the congregants celebrated their heroes by adorning them with titles of honor mind you i can't say they were all entirely coherent titles they're still rather new to language after all Two titles in particular were bizarrely, or perhaps fittingly, contradictory. Joshua was crowned with the Wise Fool of the Jellyfish moniker for his savage if reckless assault on the eel, whilst Ashley became known as the brainless hero of darkness, pursuant to the tale of her time in the Great Blue Hole. Simultaneously hurt and encouraged by her title, Ashley gained plus one permanent strength, but she lost one permanent speed, and she'll need to rest to recover from her disemboweling in the depths. Despite the festivities and atmosphere of cheer, Darian's gaze was drawn shoreward, searching the stormy horizon for signs of that spectral ship. Her eyes caught another glimmer of it between the waves, and more hauntingly it was closer than before. An agonizing pulse pounded in her brain as the sense of impending doom tightened its tendrils on her mind. She clenched her eyes shut, but the ship's ethereal visage was seared into her subconscious. If she couldn't find a way to excise that cerebral etching from her mind, and soon, she felt her doom was destined. As the celebration wound down, the survivors fell asleep to the peaceful sounds of sea waves lapping against the stone-faced shore. In their slumber, the congregants were surprised to find they inhabited a shared dream space. Shrouded in shadow, the survivors felt lost, 
until a beautiful woman in dark robes emerged from the darkness. Her gentle hand extended, she reached out and guided the congregants through the lightless void. Upon waking, the congregants looked to a leader to interpret their shared vision. Darian, with resignation, readied herself to share her despair-laden thoughts, but then the eelborn stepped forward. He spoke a message of hope, indicating the stranger to be a herald of good fortune for the coastal congregation. Their last haul was a testament to this truth, it seemed. Passion burning in their bosoms, the congregants rejoiced, shouting exclamations of praise across the sea. Then, eager to gather their blessings and apply them to their settlement's next endeavors, the congregants demonstrated their gratitude by putting their blessings to work. Having spent much of his life on land, Joseph conceived a revolutionary idea. What if the survivors could harness the power of land as a portable platform somehow? Something akin to a mobile shoal, one that could bear the weight of the survivors and keep them afloat in the water. The congregants initially thought the idea absurd, but Darian spoke in support of the endeavor. The one benefit of being constantly terrorized by the mental image of a ghost ship is that it provided a great, if maddening, point of reference for such a construct. Darian, with the handy help of the scrap-savvy Robert, led the settlement in constructing its first rudimentary watercraft, a buoyant, ramshackle rawhide contraption the settlement called a boat. Even amidst the throes of terror, Darian turned that terror into a tool, and perhaps one final spite against the sword of Damocles she felt bearing down on her neck. That's what makes her our matriarch. Will this boat prove seaworthy? Or will our land-loving survivors prove to be awkward pilots of this new raft and send it to a watery grave? We'll have to wait and see. Tune in next time to see our congregant party head out to its next hunt aboard its very first vessel. Thanks everyone for watching and braving these stormy seas with me. I'm really glad that you lovely people seem to be enjoying the campaign so far, and I know I sure am. Until next time, happy gaming everyone.